The indigenous people, the native people of this land, is called Shoshone. The mainly ones around this Central Avenue is the Gabrielino people. Then became now the Colour people. Land. We say, welcome home, brother. Welcome home, brother. Central Avenue needs to be through the time, yeah, the heart of unity among our people here in LA. Jazz. I mean, we have to support jazz. So if we don't recognize it, it's going to go by the wayside. And with that said, will the ushers please come down and take up a collection? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. <laughs> this tune is written by George Cable. It's called Morning Song. Makes you want to do this, huh? This is a very special event today. We're recognizing Central Avenue Jazz. Buddy Collette, Melba Liston, Jackie Kelso, Marl Young, Clara Bryant, Roy Porter. A round of applause for these great personalities of jazz. Mr. Jackie Kelso. He has played with people like Bill Berry, Benny Carter, King Ori, Nelson Riddle. In 1956, he joined the great Johnny Otis as a featured saxophone soloist. Um, this area actually um, was always in my mind. I grew up in Watts. We were out there in Watts. Uh, I went to Jordan High School, and uh, there was the Woodman Brothers. I don't know how many of you know the, about the Woodman Brothers, but their father, Mr. Woodman, Britt Woodman Sr., uh, wanted his youngster, I think there were four of them, to be musicians. So we were out there, and these gentlemen uh, learned to play when they were about 13 or 14 years old. But he began his studies and musical career as a saxophonist during the 1930s. But he was a major force behind the 1953 amalgamation of the previously segregated Los Angeles Musicians Union. But his versatile talents have made him 
a first call studio musician for over 40 years and part of the creative energy that formed the first interracial symphony in the world. But I think the, the, the inspiration that a bunch of us, Charlie Mingus and um, uh, let's see, a few others out there, Dave Bryant, a few of the players got was trying to keep up with these, these uh, youngsters who are our same age. And then a little after that, uh, you know, the trying to um, learn our instruments that well, uh, we had a chance to come to Jefferson High School with a band that we had created at Jordan. And we came up for like an assembly or something, and then I had a chance to meet my dear friend next to me, Mr. Jackie Kelson, uh, and also Chico Hamilton, who was Forrest Hamilton, Hamilton at the time, Forrest Horn Hamilton. And there was an audition at the Million Dollar Theater down on 3rd and Broadway, which I think the theater is still there. And they had three or four bands, and Jackie and Chico were with a man named Mr. Myatt. He was a guy about 30 years old, so that was a pretty old guy to us. We were 16 or 17. But I was the leader of, say, my band. I was about 16. And so I think we played as well as they did, but we still lost. I had Charlie Mingus on bass. But anyway, Mr. Meyer called me and said, Buddy, we'd like to add you to our band. So that's how we started our relationship. And that was our first paying job. I think it was uh, $21 a week. How about that? <laughs> $21.50, he said. Okay, that was our beginning. So just to put a little cap on that is that I said this has got to be the greatest business in the world. We were having so much fun and we made money. <laughs> the show was such a success. It ran week after week after week. And apparently the accountants figured out how they could increase their bottom line. And one was to cut the salaries of the musicians. <laughs> they cut us from... 2150 a week to 1950 a week buddy and I to this day still laugh about it because we didn't care we were still richer than we'd ever been in our life 1950 a week last word was owned by a guy by the name of Esmond Mosby his brother Curtis Mosby owned the um, Alabama and uh, Jackie was talking about how the money would go down. We were working at the Alabama, and uh, <laughs> Curtis had a way of, he'd, pay, he'd make out your check, you know, for a certain amount of money, and then you had to kick back about $5. <laughs> this is what we call playing ball. And someone reported it to the Musicians Union, and this was after we had amalgamated and gone out to Local 47. And so the... Uh, Officials there made Curtis Mosby start paying us uh, through the union. We'd get our check out there and still have to come back and pay him $5. <laughs> anyway, we were still always short $5. And his brother did the same thing at the last word when I worked there. You know, They were good businessmen, but they were businessmen <laughs> looking out for themselves. Ms. Cora Bryant. You know, I was from the swing era and the Louis Armstrong era. When I heard all that music that they called bebop, my whole music thing turned and went north to Alaska because I didn't know what was going on. Some of the songs I couldn't even find one on. And everybody has to find one before you can do anything. <laughs> but these guys were cooking up a pot of bebop like you never would believe. Anyway, that and Roy was sitting there. You know, Roy doesn't know this, but um, when I first <laughs> saw him playing the drums, you know, Roy would sit there with his head kind of cocked to the side, and, and then, I'm going to tell on you, <laughs> Roy would be, he would be surveying the audience while he's playing, you know, because Roy loved the little girls. <laughs> He loved the little girls, <laughs> but he never gave me that look. <laughs> so later on, with one of the girl groups that I work with, called the Queens of Swing, decided I was going to play the trumpet with the right hand and the drums with the left. <laughs> and I, uh, I patterned my music. I would drop bombs like, <laughs> you know, we called Roy Porter the bomb dropper because he had a way of 
of playing a beat, he wouldn't play four four with his drum, uh, with his bass drum. He would drop a bum, what we call like whenever he felt like that was a proper moment to drop the bum, he would do it. So I would watch Roy, and I began to do that too with my playing, which was really not in the context of the music that I was playing with with these girls, but I wanted to be like Roy Porter. You're gone now. with the Friends of Distinction. Now when I got to New York, I was only 19 years old. I was still playing swing drums. But when I got to New York, I saw people like uh, Max Roach, Art Blakey, and people, and Shadow Wilson, people of that idiom that was doing a new thing. So that made me become aware of the new thing in music. When I got out here in 1944, there was no people, drummers, per se, talking about the drum standpoint. There were no drummers out here doing the thing that I was doing. My big band later on played all over this place. And when Bird came out here with Charlie Parker, he wanted me to make his records with him. So I made the first four records with Charlie Parker, which had become worldwide standards. Night in Tunisia, Ornithology, Moose to Moose, and Yardbird Suite. We went back in the studio on July 29th. This was done on March 28th. Went back in the studio July 29th, 1946 and we did the ill-fated Lover Man, which is known all over the world. So that's when I say that music had changed. When he came out here, that was a musical revolution. Now the blues musician, I mean, there was a kind of a little thing that we didn't get along that well because they didn't understand what we were doing because all they could do was play maybe one or two changes on their horn, uh, playing blues. But bebop was a different thing where people had to make their own lines to different things like uh, 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 High High the Moon, which became ornithology. So uh, it's, it's, it's pretty hard to explain, but it was a re musical revolution. It started on the West Coast out here on Central Avenue. Some of my favorite at the time were Teddy Edwards, Ward Elgrave, Roy Porter, Buddy Collette, Hampton Halls. Chuck Thompson. Lonnie Hampton, who lived on 10th Avenue, right off of Central. Count Basie, Duke Ellington. And the Carter was down here. Frank Sinatra, all of them, they used to come. Well, they would perform at the theaters, in, like the alternate theater, the Million Dollars, and this, the Lincoln, and then they would, you know, come here. At the time, they weren't great, but they're great now, and you didn't realize what a privilege it was to be with them. Well, I went to a little club called the, uh, the Turban Room, uh -huh. and that was the hottest spot in town, believe me. Uh -huh. Even better than the Chicken Shack and uh, Jack's Basket Room. We had the, the best little group in town. I had Lester Young's uh, brother playing uh -huh. drums with me, 
and uh, Lena Horn's bass player was playing with me, and we tore it up. Did you ever it. spend any nights in the Dunbar Hotel? Oh, I, mean, yeah, I, I stayed there. No, I, no, I stayed there. Yeah, yeah, no, I when I first got out here, I stayed at the Dunbar. Uh huh. It was so funny because Gerald Wilson was a good friend of mine. He'd fall out his, with his wife, and he'd come stay with me, and she'd call up and say, "Is my Gerald there?" Oh. <laughs> There's only one, Paul Humphreys. Give it to him. I've been in this area ever since 1944. When I came here, the Dunbar and Central Avenue was known as Black Hollywood because they could perform out in Hollywood, but they couldn't, you know, they couldn't live out there. They would have to come back here to the Dunbar. And we really wasn't allowed to be out there on Sunset and Vine unless she was working in the 40s and the 50s. Wow. You had to have some kind of documentation that you had served a party or something. So that's the way it was when I came here. Jack Johnson lived here, was resident here, such a page. This hotel was built in 1928 by Mr. and Mrs. Somerville. Later on, it was changed to the Dunbar in 1950. This was the uh, lot where we would always dance when uh, we came to the Dunbar. We was about to lose the Dunbar. Bernard Johnson purchased it in the 50s and donated it back to the neighborhood. The stairway on the left is where our entertainers, they would come from each direction when they perform here. We had a nightclub here. Club Alabama, last word, and uh, the plantation, you know what I mean? The Dime Beat was on this corner, last word on across the street, Dunbar, I mean the, yeah, the Al Club Alabama, the Dunbar Hotel, the Mimo. <laughs> I made all of them, because <laughs> I was young then. We were doing 
a black thing. At that time, we didn't have to talk about being black because we lived it every day. Black was beautiful to us every day. Black was our thing, and we lived it. As a musician, and a female musician, and a horn player, it wasn't that easy. I had a manager say, well, what, what should I do with you? I said, the same thing you do with the male trumpet players. I was the only, only and first female horn player to play with Charlie Parker. Local 47, I got a call to play with an all-girl, a white all-girl band who was on television. Her name, the lady's name was Ada Leonard. And I played one week with that band and then they got letters saying to get the nigger off the show. The nigger was me. And, <laughs> and so I lost that job. But being female hasn't been all that bad. In fact, I've loved every minute of it. We have world-renowned pianist, Marl Young. Right. Mr. Young made recordings with T-Bone Walker and blues singers like Little Miss Corn Shucks. In 1958, he auditioned for the Desi Lu Workshop Theater. And as a result... I was there for about a year. And then during the same time, I coached her for her appearance on Broadway in Wildcat. Then I became the pianist for the Hilly Lucy Show when they went back on the air in 1962. I in 1969, Gary Morton, uh, Lucy's husband, said, of course you've conducted to picture and clock. I had never conducted to picture and clock in my life. <laughs> I had already done pre-scores. When you do pre-scores, you record the music and they film to that. When you do background music, they do the film, then you apply the music to that. But since he said, of course I had conducted picture and clock, I didn't answer him. I just said, what time is the session? <laughs> So I said, I got four days to learn to conduct a picture and clock. So I bought, I had a metronome, I bought a stopwatch, I called Benny Carter, whom I knew had done that type of work, and he gave me encouragement. He says, I think with your background, you're, you're the ones that I feel could do it. And so for four days, I stayed up. Uh, I had to write one of the shows. For, for four days, I stayed up with no sleep, learning how to conduct a picture and clock and was doing a job at the Beverly Hilton at the same time. I was the musical director, composer, arranger, piano player for, for four years for the Here's Lucy show. I think I wrote about 90 background shows. Uh, and conducted. Uh, but there's one thing I want to emphasize. It's very important that people of my race and other minorities get positions where they can hire and fire. Every time there was a white musician that couldn't make it, I replaced him with a black musician. But I made sure that that black musician could play. And so for four years, for four years, I enjoyed being musical director for the Lucille Ball Productions, and it was one of the high points of my life. Thank you.
One of her first professional jobs was as a player in the pit orchestra of the L.A. Lincoln Theater. That was around 42. She's performed, composed, arranged for a veritable who's who, Duke Ellington, to Count Basie, Aretha Franklin, even, and the Boston Pops. She has been, maybe without knowing it, um, a real role model for me, since she gave me one of my very first jobs playing in her band with uh, Leslie Drake. In 43, I know she played with uh, Gerald Wilson's band. In 49, Dizzy Gillespie sent for her to come back to the East Coast to write and play for his big band. And in the 50s, I, I've heard the story that she toured the South with uh, Billie Holiday, and it left her very deeply disturbed, you know, the, the Jim Crow conditions that were there at the time. And she stayed off the road and almost contemplated abandoning music for a while. But she rejoined Dizzy Gillespie in 56. The uh, conditions with which women and jazz musicians had to labor also played a, a part in shaping some of uh, her preferences. She says she was scared of the guys a little bit. And she admitted in, a, in an interview that it was because they get so jealous of girls. <laughs> Melba Liston. I, I, don't, I don't talk very much. Uh, I used to not talk at all. <laughs> and then when I had the stroke, and I just, you know, I'm still writing. I'm writing for uh, uh, Randy Weston, writing now for St. Louis. It's all brass, and it's, I, you know, it's, it's very hard. <laughs> Hightower was one of the uh, ladies that had a school, and Melba was in her kitty band. <laughs> she was in Miss Hightower's band when they were playing on the street corners out here on Central Avenue yeah. and passing their hat. Yeah, that and she was, said the boys. That was 30, what? 39, 38, uh, 30, mm. uh, 38, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the boys could pass, pass the hat. Yeah, and, the and they would take a little money out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, uh, and they played at, at uh, was South went? Park, what's that other park? Um, you guys, because I have a picture of you guys in the park, and they were, the radio station was there, the truck is there, and you guys uh, are, were playing. I can't remember you had on Hawaii, and I, you had on, uh, oh, <laughs> had on a mid rib and a grass skirt. Oh, dear. And a lay around oh, your neck. Yeah, I don't you remember Don't remember that. that? <laughs> Next time you see me. Things won't be the same Well, next time, next time Things won't be the same The music nowadays, is, it's, it's kind of made a complete turn as, as far as feel and, and substance. Well, it's a day to say All that shines like that it's changed somewhat, but I think a lot of the influence has been from, you know, the record companies, not to say they're the ones to blame. They've made a lot of money off a certain music that sells. Records can confuse you. I mean, it's a great job, the great technology that they have today, but a lot of times they're marketing, you know, and um, it's not the real product. It's more like a frozen food compared to a real dinner. The music now, <laughs> it's, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. it's terrible. Do want to Dizzy and, mm -hmm. and those and that era. And we're, we're going to do those things again.
Jefferson High School and Jordan High School were so prominent and back in the 40s. There was a teacher named Sam Brown who taught so many of the greats, you know, the Dexter Gordons and, you know, there's Roy Ayers, people like that came out of, 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 of Jefferson. When I came through, there was no one in my area uh, that really understood a young black man or African-American trying to play the music. All my teachers, the majority of them were white, and I thought that there was a void there. And uh, so I just tried to fill that void. You look at bebop, it's a very sophisticated form of music. In fact, that's one of the, probably one of the more, most sophisticated and, and intellectually involved forms of music uh, in, in black music. And I think that a student can't just sit down and play that without studying it. But at the same time, some kids may run from it because of the intellectual aspect of it. But once they get into it, it's innate for them to excel in it if given the opportunity through exposure and connecting to you know, some jazz legends, some jazz greats that, and you know, LA is full of them. There's a history uh, that started on Central Avenue and, uh, and it's, it's kind of like, it, it uh, rivals New York in a way. Hey, Reggie, what hey, do you know, yeah, what are you doing? doing? Obviously being interviewed, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, speaking me, of me. a living legend, here's Jackie Kelso, a native of Los Angeles. Yeah, right, but tell me, what, what does rap sheet mean? Is that uh, well, special significance? Actually, I didn't plan on, uh, didn't know I was going to be interviewed, and I guess it's spontaneous. I kind of spent a lot of time learning about rap and spending a lot of time because a lot of my students are into rap. So. Well, right, you've got to go with the kids' interests. That's well, right. and, and kind of show them that there's a, there's a lot of similarities between hip hop and bebop. Rhythm. Yes. And the rhyme. Yeah, well, well, I like and the purpose. And the purpose. Okay, tell me what the purpose of I think I think they have social statements talking about the times. Yes. And being being reflective of, of, of their root. Yes. And and being uh, not so much dealing with quote unquote the prejudices and the and the black and white riffs, but the bottom line is that we have to make stands for ourselves. Exactly. And I think that uh, there's a there's a cr uh, quite a bit of uh, I think the rappers sometimes forget that there's music. I think a lot of times when I talk to the young rappers, they don't want to relate to the music aspect, but when you, when you expose them to it, they're very open to it. And then they start relating to what your generation is saying. Well, I'm Isaac Solis, and um, I attend Jefferson High School, and I'm waiting for Mr. Pablo Rodriguez. This is my way of telling Duke Ellington, thank you. Actually, I'm doing a project, and I'm trying to wait on. I'm trying to. Oh, I'm waiting for for Miss Pablo Rodriguez. I saw him perform, and I asked him if he could give me an interview, and he said yes. Well, let's wait for him. I'm assistant coordinator for the jazz mentorship program. For the past five years, we've presented leading recording artists in more than 50 free concerts in the community. Plus. We give young musicians a chance to jam with the veterans. And now there's a revitalization on Central Avenue through the Somerville Place One housing project. Too long in coming, but now that it's here, we're going to keep it here. Put your hands together, come on, we're going to have a party. Now uh, that's where it's at. Hey, you must. What you sing about? Do we have any singers out there? What? And pray. Welcome to the Central Avenue Baptist Church. This is the way we pray on the old Right.
it was uh, it was Brother Hannah said he would bring all the gospel singers and you talk about a time we would have you yeah. remember that? But it was <laughs> absolutely what they were the best food. And the best uh, food was really how they would fry and chicken. Uh, we, <laughs> Reverend Chambers said they we go somewhere. I like they even go to Jacobs. Yeah. To the restaurant Jacobs, and they're still open. And you talking about eating? Oh, we yes. had the great long so, purple limousine. You know, I guess that's why we. Same, oh, like I you know, we had a special made limousine, and it holds twelve uh, sick passengers. And it was, you know, it was white at first, and then we changed it, changed it to purple. And you talking it about? Purple people uh, people. We call it the purple people. <laughs> But you talking about a drive on thing. Central Avenue. Yeah. And when I first yeah. came here, I had never experienced anything like Central Avenue. Well, it was similar, I guess, to New York, but it was just it a was. different feel. Oh, my yeah. God. And, and you would come, we would go up there, we would come on Central Avenue, the Dumbo Hotel, and then we would see like stars like Aretha Franklin and Tina Turner. And <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, yeah. But we had to go to church. <laughs> Dixie Hummingbirds, the Clara Ward singers back then were not living in Los Angeles. They would come from Philadelphia and they would send for us and we would sing there at Reverend Tim Chambers Church. So uh, I, in essence, the Reverend Tim Chambers was the main source of bringing the gospel singers here and also Brother Henderson was the promoter right. and another yeah. great man was Reverend Joe Matthews, yes. would bring gospel groups and manage Lawrence Welch, and those were the people that introduced mainly gospel to Central Avenue. This song was the first million dollar All right. gospel record. Slaves would sing in the fields. They would, they, their songs had meanings. You know, it's time to go. But it always had a message, uh, and a message when they were packing up and they were leaving. Well, this packing was up is one of the, no, no traveling uh, shoes. Is, is, uh, is, is a song that, that that is a slave song, mm -hmm. and they would sing traveling shoes. And by the way, that that's our hit. Mm -hmm. the, this group, particular group, is our hit, um, traveling shoes and. During that time, they were singing like a spiritual, and that was the, the clue to, for the people to ride. Traveling shoes, got on my traveling shoes. Traveling shoes, Lord, got on my traveling shoes. Back then, shoes. they sang like this. Traveling shoes, got on my traveling shoes. Oh, traveling shoes, got on And so, for the 60s and the 90s, we get traveling shoes. Got on my traveling shoes. I can travel. Got on my traveling shoes. I want my mission now. Got on my traveling shoes. Feel my traveling. Got on my traveling shoes. And and so it's all the the feel of jazz, gospel, blues, and the blues. <laughs> 
So much traveling, never know when you around. That was the great Miss Don Washington. Then Billy Holiday said, My man don't love me, treats me oh so mean. My man don't love me, treats me oh so mean. You know he's the meanest man that you ever seen. Then Aretha came along. I've been knowing her since she was a baby, before she was out. And baby, honey, when she made that uh, song, I don't want nobody always sitting around me and my man. Hey, Dr. Feelgood, that was the name of that. <laughs> I was always up and down Central Avenue, even in the daytime, when there was no entertaining. But the bars were open. I just liked it. It was a nice place to go. You could go and enjoy yourself, sit up. We had all kind of restaurants, you know, soul food and everything. You could take your babies in there and eat. You wouldn't have to be frightened or anything. It was just simply beautiful. I worked with Johnny Otis. Uh, when I was working with Roy Milton, I traveled on the road with Roy Milton. Jackie Kelso was our music director with the Roy Milton's group. So that's why I say, don't throw your love on me so strong. Hey, baby, cause your love is like a posse. You know it turns off and on. I was really on the avenue during the 30s because as a kid, I knew that that's where the glamour was. And I didn't join Johnny Otis until 1956. Played with Lionel Hampton for two years, Roy Milton. I guess Lionel Hampton was what? Bebop and swing. The first thing, I guess, was uh, playing my first dance at the Elks Auditorium. Another high point was joining the Musicians Union when I was, uh, I guess, 17 years old. Uh, Buddy Collette and I were in the same band and we were working at the Elks Auditorium on a regular basis on Sundays and the union, the Black Musicians Union on Central Avenue started picketing our dance and uh, they made us such an attractive offer where they would allow the entire band to come in at a greatly reduced price. So I think the whole band joined, I think the initiation fee had been cut down to 
$12.50. So the whole band joined the union. And that was what a thrill to feel that, wow, we were professional musicians and we were still in high school. I think maybe we'd better speak about the segregation of the musicians' union. I got a, uh, a visitor one morning by a gentleman by the name of John Anderson, and he said, we want you to come to a meeting. I said, for what? He said, well, we're members of a municipal band, and because of the fact that we are advocating the desegregation of the musicians' union here, we were fired from our jobs. So I felt that if they could do that to them, they could do that to me. At the time, there was local 767 and 1710 South Central. There was local 47 in Hollywood. We formed an amalgamation committee and we contacted local 47 and told them that we wished to start discussions concerning the amalgamation of the two unions. We had our first meeting and at that time they told us if we would get rid of our union, close down our operation, that they then would accept us as members of the new union. I volunteered, I thought at that time foolishly, to write a proposal that would set out the terms and condition of the amalgamation of the two locals. So we asked them to put it on their ballot at the 1952 election. At the 1952 election, all we needed was a majority of, 50, of one over 50%. We won that election by 232 votes. We then asked the... And in January of 1953, we had the vote at the Black Union. And on April 1st, 1953, Local 47 started accepting black members from Local 767. At the time, we didn't ask for any black officers, but we felt that some of us would be political animals and would start politicking as soon as we got to 47, which I did. <laughs> and every black musician said that they wanted me to become the first black officer, so that meant that they had confidence in me, and I felt honored to have been so selected. I also was a member of the Board of Trustees, which has to do with the investment of the, people, of the uh, union's money. And every time I was on the Board of Trustees, I made sure that they knew something about the uh, black uh, savings and loans, and the last time I was on the Board of Trees, I saw that we pro uh, deposited at least 95000 in family savings and loans. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jack McVeigh. It's the baby's first jazz festival, and he's a little percussionist. See? So he already got his chops down, you see that? Ready to go. Okay. What gets you inspired to become a jazz musician, not other like, um, can be like rock star or whatever? Well, the jazz music was so attractive to me when I was young. First, it was just the trumpet. But as I grew older, I loved the idea of improvisation. Now, improvisation is when you can just play 
without looking at music, and you make up your ideas, and the music comes out of your instrument. Well, what do you think about rock music in these days, or, or hip hop, or whatever, compared to your old days, you know, when jazz was hot? Did you say old days? Well, sorry. <laughs> oh. uh, compared to the days where you were famous? Well, when I was a young boy, it was rock and roll. And then as I got older, it was acid rock. Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, the Beatles. And I think every generation has their own desire to identify with their own music. I think the hip hop today is, I think the groove is beautiful. The, the rhythm of it is wonderful. The rap idea is not a new idea, but I think it's a wonderful um, new beginning.
if we can learn something today, it is that this music lives. As I walk down the street, seems everyone I meet just gives me a friendly hello, hello. Birds and all the trees, they seem so lonely. They sing wherever I go. You know I. I'm just a lucky so and so. And I thought y'all had forgot about us, but we're so happy that you came. Peace.